What does a pharmacist do? Well, most people might answer that a pharmacist dispenses the medications that my doctor prescribes. Now, I work with a ton of great pharmacists, and one thing that I don't generally see is excitement about pills in a vial. And this is probably because pharmacists have been trained to do so much more. So what can you get excited about in your community? To find out, let's go Beyond the Scripts. Welcome back to Beyond the Scripts. So 2020 was a heck of a year, 2021, also a little bit different than uh, what we've experienced in the past. But there are some interesting trends that are beginning to emerge. So if you spend some time looking around online, you'll find all kinds of interesting changes in consumer behavior, how people are acting, what's selling. So it's not all strictly doom and gloom. There are some interesting facts and trends out there. One of those is that things that people are using at home has definitely improved or um, improved in the marketplace anyways. Um, so you're seeing things like furniture sales go up, uh, musical instruments, uh, games, online games, a lot of things, but basically um, things that people are using at home. Uh, home improvement stores have seen a lot of um, booms in sales because they've remained open, but it comes down to people spending a lot of time at home redecorating, getting their homes in order. And that's kind of one of the things that we're going to talk about today with the pharmacist who has kind of taken that approach to really concentrate on his business over the past few months, especially. And it pairs really well with that New Year's resolution that we all have to take the bull by the horns, get organized, do things differently. Uh, 2021, this is the year that we're going to do that, right? So with us today, we have Brad White, who's joining us from the Medicine Center Pharmacy up in, where is it, Canton, Ohio? Canton, Ohio today, yes. All right. Awesome. So Brad, tell us a little bit before we dive in about um, Medicine Center Pharmacies, your locations, and um, you know how you got where you're at now. Okay. Well, we um, Medicine Center Pharmacy was started just about 45 years ago by my father, Paul White. And uh, we started our journey as medicine shops. He had... Um, made one too many trips into the pharmacy at the local chain he was working at and couldn't get past the lottery ticket counter. So he had to keep selling lottery tickets before he could go dispense prescriptions. <laughs> and he, he knew he didn't go to pharmacy school to uh, dispense uh, lottery tickets. So um, ironically, like a couple days later in the mail, he got a postcard for Medicine Shop International and... Um, opened his first store here in Canton, Ohio in 1976. Um, so after that, it grew to uh, five locations, uh, four community pharmacies and one long-term care. And um, we're currently running on Pioneer Central Server and we've liked the advantages that that's helped us uh, glean in our operation because we've actually converted one of our locations to a central fill. So that kind of helps us manage our MedSync inventory a lot better. And we've been able to pull almost $200,000 out of our off-the-shelf inventory by leveraging that central fill for our MedSync patients. So um, we have um, a big presence of another chain, which I guess I won't mention here in, to be PC. But um, it's interesting because they do their central fill different. So if you go to the doctor and you're going to get a Lipitor prescription, that prescription hits the pharmacy of choice but then goes straight to their central fill. So then the patient shows up. And they can't get their prescription there because it's at the central fill in another town. So it creates a lot of duplication of effort, and there's been a lot of unhappy patients. So one of the neat things is, is we've been able to just focus our central fill on our MedSync patients, and we utilize Pioneer software to leverage that. So it's been really neat to do, and um, we've been able to leverage some of our um, robotic automation to do that too. So I guess we started with typewriters and rotary dial phones in 1976 and now we got computers everywhere and robots and all kinds of crazy stuff so it's it's really fascinating to see how long things have how much things have transitioned through all that time yeah so that's one of the things that um i think is notable about uh brad white and about uh medicine center is that technology a lot of times or change in general a lot of times can seem like a barrier um 
but you describe it as fascinating. <laughs> so that's a, you know, and, and I like toys. Unique, yeah. <laughs> it's a unique way of looking at things. And, and since you said uh, you like toys, I am going to bring up now people who are passionate about um, their profession are often passionate in other areas of their lives. So um, just for a second, sidebar, um, I was watching this video uh, on Facebook where this red Jeep that might go by the name of Christine is jumping up these rocks and, and like the, the front end just kind of came apart on you. So tell me a l like a little bit about the, the Jeep hobby. Cause I think that's pretty cool. You know, it kind of happened by accident. I was, um, I don't remember. Oh, I know why. So I bought my first Jeep Wrangler. It was in 2013 and it was because, I was just in a car accident because somebody rear-ended me. So it kind of made me mad, and I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I thought, I'm going to buy an orange Jeep. So my first <laughs> Jeep was an orange Jeep. I figured if you can't see an orange pumpkin Jeep on the road, then we've got a whole other set of problems. So then that kind of led to um, experimenting off-road with some friends locally that I met. And um, then my wife... This is worth documenting. My wife said, you know, your orange Jeep's really nice. You probably ought to get something else that you could take off road so that you don't, you know, scratch the orange one or hurt it. So my wife let me buy another Jeep. It was great. <laughs> and so that Jeep is what you mentioned. The red Jeep is Christine. And it Christine got its name because it had an auto start in it that I didn't know about. And if you can believe it, it matched the frequency on our ceiling fan. So when you turned on the ceiling fan, the Jeep tried to start in the garage. <laughs> so we were convinced it was like Christine, the car in the movie, starting itself. And, you know, Lord knows what was going to happen. So they were both red. But, yeah, I really enjoy being in the woods. And it's a nice therapeutic result of uh, getting away from the hustle and bustle of the pharmacy. And, and really, it's one of the things that maybe we can talk about today is, you know, there's more to life than work. And I don't want to be consumed 60 hours a week by trying to do everything because there's always going to be something else to do. So you got to have that time out to, to have some fun and play in the woods and see what man and machine can do. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's one of the interesting shifts and in, um, like in this generation, you know, and it's fun to it, every generation, I guess, thinks it's fun to slam the other generations. But, you know, general, like generalizationally, if I can get the word out, there is definitely a shift in thinking where, you know, um, my dad's generation was like, if you're throwing up sick and got a fever and you march into the office, you're a trooper, you know, and today it's like, well, that's, that's not a wise thing to do. You need to take care of yourself and protect the workforce. And so there's definitely that shift, but I see that also in, um, you know, in business owners and in management is there's a reason you're there, uh, working 80 hours a week and, and making your, yourself, uh, operate at less than a hundred percent capacity is probably not the best thing. So, one of the things I thought was interesting in an email you sent me recently was you were really excited about putting some things in place to change that. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how you've approached that, maybe some problems that made you identify that, hey, I'm doing this uh, in a way that could be improved. I think the first thing that kind of was a blinding flash of the obvious was uh, for 20 years, um, I managed and ran uh, one of our pharmacies in New Philadelphia, Ohio. And I was really fortunate to have a pharmacist who was my right hand. And we worked really well together, still do. And she was the kind of person that um, we were able to kind of sync in a fashion where we could finish each other's sentences. We could understand, you know, if something happened, she'd know what I would like a situation to be handled as or how to resolve it. And it was really cool because it didn't dawn on me until I moved to a different role in our company that I'd go on vacation and I'd only get a phone call if there was really a problem. Everything was neat and tidy tied up with a bow. So I guess I felt like we had a really good system there. We knew how to communicate well. We knew she was empowered to 
and is empowered to fix some problems if we had customer service issues or if we have power outages and how to power things back up and how to troubleshoot all that crazy tech and stuff that happens. Um, so when I moved to my new role in our company where I'm kind of I'm kind of part operations, I'm kind of part marketing, I'm kind of part IT. I'm wearing a lot of hats because we're trying to be very efficient with our uh, payroll. And um, one of the things that I'm noticing is, is that not all of our locations have people that are trained in a fashion that can help or feel confident in dealing with a problem that may come up on a daily basis. So my mantra lately has kind of been um, to fix the system and use what I call customer service failures, and they're not always customer service failures, but to use an example of, okay, Mr. Jones came in the pharmacy and he came to pick up his prescription, his MedSync order, and you look in the point of sale, it says it's in will call, you go to will call, it's not there. Well, why isn't it there? Where is it? What happened? Well, oh, it looks like technician Susie pulled the bag out because another order came in from the doctor, but she didn't scan it out of will call. So then you got the technician bouncing from station to station and the customer's looking at you going, what is going on? Do they know what they're doing back there? So I guess one of my focuses has really been to not only try to eliminate that single point of failure where there's only one person that knows how to troubleshoot bringing up a server again or fixing the robot or trying to figure out what happened here that caused a customer service delay or failure or some hurt feelings. So it's been interesting. It's certainly a work in progress and it's not by any means close to being done, but I've enjoyed the challenge of, okay, well, this happened because of this. How do we fix our workflow and our process so that we take that variable out and it doesn't happen again and then move on to the next thing that comes up? So um, I, I really, one of my goals is in the spirit of not working 60, 80 hours a week is I really want and am actively trying to develop systems in our pharmacy where we can train our staff. They can feel empowered to make decisions that maybe, you know, as long as they have the training and the confidence and the wherewithal to do it, they can do it. And hopefully at, at the same time, we streamline a lot of phone calls back and forth to the home office or to other stores or how to, what do I do and, and delaying basically the quality service that we really want to deliver to our patients. Yeah. So when you do encounter those things, you know, when you do have a, uh, the example you gave, uh, with, it was pulled out of will call. So how do you create a system around that? How do you give that feedback, not only to that specific person at that time, but do you, have you put together like a process for, Hey, here's, here's where we had an issue. Let's document this and talk about it on our Wednesday morning meeting, or what is, what's the process there for actually capturing that opportunity? So we have a company intranet at the moment where uh, it's only available in our pharmacies. And it's kind of a, it's basically a WordPress website that has current events and things going on. And it's kind of evolved over the years and it's getting kind of messy, which is kind of, it's kind of why I want to change it. But we have a form, a link there that we use, um, a MailChimp form. And um, basically, they can go in, document what happened, how did we discover what the problem was, the or what was the cause, and then a suggestion for how to fix it. So um, it's interesting because there's many weeks where I don't get any suggestions, and I'm thinking, wow, you guys were perfect this week. Nothing happened, right? <laughs> wait, wait, but, you know, I think it's one of our challenges, whether it be an e-care plan or documenting an MTM. We come from a culture of 40 plus years in our company where problem presents itself, solve the problem, move on. But we need to fix the system so that we aren't continually telling technician number two, you know, you made a done the data entry on your SIG, we, we've got to, you know, button this up. Um, so it's, it's not... Um, it's a system that's worked pretty well, and now I've got kind of a new database program that we're using that's web-based that uh, we're getting ready to roll out here to the staff, and it's the same kind of thing. You know, capture what happened, make a suggestion of what you believe was the cause, and how would you like to fix it in your pharmacy, and then share it with the whole company. So it's, um, it's something that can be reviewed in their weekly meetings. Um, it's something that... Um, 
we haven't had one yet this year. We've been kind of with Christmas and whatnot and figuring out when we're going to get COVID vaccine. It's been a little busy, but we usually have pharmacist meetings by Zoom um, like once a month or every two months at the worst. And then we share, you know, what's going on or these are the current events that we're looking at and things like that. So it's a work in progress. It's not perfect, but there are some things that we've been able to fix that I'm pretty proud of. And I know we can make a better effort at having a better experience for our patients. Nice. So that's a great way to handle those kind of issues that pop up during the day, during workflow. Um, when you started kind of on this mission to um, streamline your pharmacy, did you have some major goals like that were sweeping changes that you wanted to make? Or did you have like something at the finish line to start that march? You know, um, I guess... I was really lucky to work in a store that had a very consistent staff. And much like I mentioned, the pharmacist Janice uh, earlier, who was really complimented my skills. We have many technicians in that location that have been with us for over a decade. And so we had a really good unit. And it was one of those things where people really worked well together. It was uh, a good team environment. And, um, Sometimes, you know, we've had some stores that have had some turnover, whether it be people moving away or just, you know, careers change and things like that for technicians. Um, and so I've noticed that our training has kind of, it hasn't been what it used to be. And we used to do on the job training and it was fine. Um, but now we're trying to be more mindful about tools like Pioneer provides us with the Pioneer University. I mean, that is just fast an awesome tool so that we can give people a nice overview in a structured manner and then complement it with on the job live what we feel is most important so we've tried to actually look at okay where do we want a staff member to start and you know we could debate about this all day but if we start a new technician who is who maybe has some uh, maybe they have some experience at another pharmacy I like them to start on a fill station because I want them to be able to figure out the basics of Pioneer, the layout, where all the workflow or where all the stuff is. I want them to know where the drugs are. I want them to be able to understand how we do med sinks because inherently every patient, every staff member we have hired from other pharmacies, they do it different. Right. Um, and it's it's been interesting. Even even pharmacies that um, have used Pioneer do it different. And um, so, but I like. You know, I I read something once where if you're hired as an Apple employee, you don't talk to your first patient for like the first month or six weeks because you're getting hyper intensive training. So I don't really want a new staff member answering a phone or waiting on a, a patient at the point of sale until they are confident. They know where to find the information. They know how to use the workflow and they have a confidence that they're not going to be left for dead at the register while somebody comes in and. You know, we always seem to have a patient that they know somebody's new and it's their goal to kind of <laughs> give them that jab, you know? And I'm like, come on. So, um, but I, we want to set them up for success. So that's gone through many iterations and we continue to refine it. Um, but it's, I, I think that it started when I was working in a location where there was a person who really, I thought had worked there long enough that should know more. And I thought, where did we fall down? You know, what did we miss? Did, did we, are we too compartmentalizing of our staff? And we've always operated by the philosophy of everybody needs to be cross-trained. So we don't have data entry people only and fillers only and counter people only. We, we rotate them because we want them to be well-rounded and be able to solve problems. And then heck, look at COVID. You know, we, we certainly didn't want a situation where our best data entry person was off on uh, quarantine and we're, yeah. We're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So, um, you know, there's different philosophies for that, but that's one that's worked well for us. And um, it's one of those processes where we try to identify an issue and then, okay, we need to do better work here. How can we set those people up for better success? And a lot of it's training, some of it's technology, and some of it is, some of it's just patience sometimes. And, um, you know, looking back at how complicated pharmacies got between MTMs and care plans and point of care testing and wholesaler orders coming in. It's there's a lot going on in a pharmacy, so it's not for the weak of of heart. It, it's not um, it's not a sit down desk job. 
you right. know, where, where you're you're just sitting in front of a PC all day. We use our PCs all day, but it, it certainly is one that's very dynamic. Well, that's probably a more um, engaging experience for your team, too, not to be pigeonholed into doing that one thing all day. And then that leaves a gap if, let's say, you know, that employee breaks their Jeep on the way to work. So, you know, definitely um, probably a good idea to have that champion for those special programs that that could really help, you know, be that go to person for for help. But uh, definitely having everybody on the same page is going to fill in those those staffing gaps, but also, like I said, build in that buy-in and that engagement to really have that strong uh, team. So you've been able to do that with uh, a lot of systems at your pharmacy. So, you know, I remember early on during COVID seeing that you had the really great drive-through or uh, curbside pickup signs out and, and you're able to get that system quickly in place. Um, so how do you go about implementing that system? You know, you've mentioned kind of uh, spending time training with the employees, but like, how do you get them to say, okay, we're going to do things differently now. Brad's got a new idea. <laughs> uh, because a lot of times people say, I don't know why we're doing it this way. Change is bad. Don't like change. I'm going to dig my heels in. You know, it's it's a common occurrence. And, um, you know, it's it's refreshing when I have one of my crazy ideas and um, and um, somebody helps me embrace it. And it you know, I've found that a lot of times it helps when you give them the why and you totally fail when you just say do this. So, you know, over the course of different things we've done, if you just say, look, we want you to do A, B and C but they don't understand why to do A, B, and C, and they want to do D, E, and F, it, it's probably going to fail. Um, if we explain to people, I think, my, I think I'm probably of the most proud of my little central fill situation because one of our pharmacists um, wanted to make a change to her work schedule, and it worked out great because we were able to, imp to implement the central fill, and since our store hours um, in the location are open to the public 9.30 to 6. She'd come in at 7, and she'd work for the first three hours uninterrupted, no phones ringing, her and another technician, and they would work through it. And she, like, basically took my wacky concept that wasn't as well-formed as it could have been and ran with it and has made it a success. Um, I mean, we've got stores with 26, 27 turns now. It's amazing. So, um, but, but there are things that... Getting buy-in is important, and I don't always do the best job, but it's something that, you know, they tell us in pharmacy school you're going to be a lifelong learner. Well, every day is a learning experience. You know, you learn something new, you figure out a better way to try to educate a person or a staff member or find an idea that can help either reduce your overhead or increase your efficiency or increase your turns. So it's it's been rewarding and challenging, and I wish I could say that it's all been easy, but it hasn't, and it continues to be a challenge in some levels. Um, we have a lot of work to do in all our stores, honestly, on implementing care plans in, a, in the best fashion. We're gaining on it, but we've got work to do. So Yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I think is neat is that MedSync system that you've implemented. What percentage of your patients would you guess you, do you have synced so far? Well, let me frame it this way. Um, so in two of our locations that we started with MedSync first, um, we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we were having some staffing challenges in a market that was really competitive. And there were like some mail orders around here in Canton and they kept peeling off technicians or we had people move away or just retire or whatnot. So we rolled two of our locations in and 47% of their daily script volume is med synced and goes through the central fill now. So basically, much like Pioneer recommends, um, the staff in that store that knows the patient calls the patient five to seven days ahead. Um, they process that claim. It goes to through central. Um, it goes through central to the central fill. They wait for the order to come in tomorrow. They fill it, count it, check it and then send it back two days before the patient's due to pick up. So, 
you know, we're continuing to strive to grow our medicine counts. Um, but it's been fascinating to see that we've reduced the burden of production on the home store pharmacists in those locations by 50%. So yeah. in theory, they have more time to do vaccines and to do MTMs. It doesn't make it easy. You know, you're still making those medicine calls. Um, you know, we're looking to centralize some phone systems and things like that to kind of take that burden off when you've got those surge weeks. Um, so we're trying really hard to do that better. But I mean, MedSync has changed the way our company operates. It really has. And I feel like we can continue to do it better. Um, but we've, it's been amazing how much we've been able to scale with the right staff in the right places to make sure that we maximize their potential. And it's been really fun to watch. So I want to talk a little bit more about that, but it occurred to me that our support center is going to be blown up with pharmacists calling and asking, what is this central fill that Brad's talking about? Um, so let's let's go ahead and describe that a little bit and move on because that that's something that not everybody's using. It's not necessarily uh, something you just turn on. Um, so go ahead and describe that a little bit, just how it works so that uh, we can save support some heartache here. <laughs> well, we're running on... Um the central system for Pioneer, and we have five locations. So basically what we've done is we have some Parada automation in one building where we've got a Parada Max for vials, and we have a Parada Pass for the strip packaging. And, um, you know, we, um, we got this machine sitting there, and it's not busy all the time. And we're looking at the maintenance fees thinking we've got to be able to get more production out of this. So what we did is we basically use our individual sessions for Pioneer. So my Minerva store. So if you're a patient or if you're a staff member of the Minerva store, you make your med sync calls from the same queue that you do at any location. Um, when you process that prescription, we use a separate inventory group. So we have an inventory group for the Parada Max drugs and we have an inventory group for the Parada Pass drugs. So that way we know which inventory pool that order is being filled out of. We know which, um, which orders are gonna go to that location and we can clearly understand which ones are coming back to the home store. So when we started, all we did was send drugs to the Parada Max, which holds like 200 medications and counts them and labels them and puts them in the vial. And in the past, you know, it does the strip packaging like pill pack. And um, we sent those patients that wanted that compliance packaging uh, thing uh, to that machine in that inventory group. So now what we've done is we've gotten better at it, worked out our bugs. So now I send the whole MedSync order. So it doesn't matter if it's got creams or inhalers or insulins. If it's counted in the robot, great, but we send the whole order so it comes back in one bag to the pharmacy and then they scan it and will call and then, you know, the IVR calls the patient or texts, texts them or, or we home deliver it or whatnot. So I honestly don't know if we're using Central Fill the way Pioneer intends it, but we couldn't do it if we didn't have the central server. And that gives me the ability at our Central Fill for a staff member to open up a session for any of our five locations right in front of them. And then they basically, we've changed our filters up in the print queue, but you know, they go through the print queue and they only deal with the drugs that are in that inventory group for that particular set of patients. So, and then at the home store, they're still filling the walk-ins out of the regular RX inventory group and the antibiotics and the one-offs and things like that. So it's very clear the division of Where's that drug coming from as long as you pick the right inventory group? Okay, so a lot of caveats there. Um, I know Mitch Archer is going to listen to this and be like, oh, man, Will, I'm going to kill you for bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because it, it is it is quite a heavy lift to make sure that, A, you have to have all your patients on MedSync. If you don't have an amazing MedSync program, you're really going to struggle. Uh, if you don't have amazing inventory controls, you're really going to struggle. But again, those are things that, you know, are kind of prerequisites, but every business should be focusing on those if they're not in line before they try to do anything else. Um, so uh, definitely need central office, need those VPNs, need strong inventory, need uh, MedSync uh, strong and active. So um, 
you know, before you call support, there's some prerequisites on uh, <laughs> on, e- on e- even trying. <laughs> yeah, and just to follow it up, you know, we used existing facilities. We didn't go and rent another space. We didn't buy another Pioneer computer. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, we, we basically just used the downtime in one of our locations that had those Parada automations. I mean, why go buy another robot for a couple hundred grand when you can get proper throughput of what you already have. And that was really the coolest thing because we were able to leverage those machines where they already were for the whole company when the other companies or the other stores didn't have any automation. So Mm. that was pretty cool. Yeah, it can definitely be done. And, you know, with MedSync, the workflow is so predictable. Um, And not only is it predictable, you're calling to double check. Uh, so it, it can definitely open some doors there, um, but you've also used that to open doors for more of those appointment-based models where you're digging in a little bit deeper than you would at just, you know, that random pick up a, a prescription at the counter and leave patient. So you're really offering a little bit more when they do come in. Let me tell you in respect to that, um, one of the things we've been really trying to do is having our Central Fill staff um, put bag tags on all the orders that are filled at Central Fill for MTM opportunities. So, you know, that pharmacist is scanning the, you know, the queue, um, whether it's one of the alerts in Pioneer or checking the outcomes queue, and then they're putting that on the bag. So then when that goes back to the home store, oh, we know that this patient needs an MTM. I mean, I want to believe that it was brought to their attention when they were called. But the good thing is, is we've had the best luck capturing our MTMs at the counter or when we home deliver them. So that's really helped us be more mindful of those opportunities and not kind of, you know, let them fall by the wayside. So it's been a pretty neat thing. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the other interesting things um, with the, uh, I guess, with the isolation of, of COVID is that, yeah, online shopping has increased a whole lot. But there's also like a very um, concerted effort to appreciate and support local businesses. And so those face-to-face interactions now are even more important and and more appreciated. And uh, I don't know, they, they just hold more weight than even a year ago because – you you exert more effort to get there, I guess. You know, um, it, it definitely seems like that face to face interaction now more than ever has so much more opportunity. Um, so tell me a little bit more about other stuff that's going on in your pharmacy. I know on your website uh, you have a section about LDN. Yes, we um, uh, one of our locations is a PCAB accredited compounding pharmacy. And one of the opportunities we've had has been to do education for patients in non-traditional treatment methods. And we've seen some patients that really have had some success with low dose naltrexone. Um, It's a product that's been on the market for decades. It's well studied. It's safe. It's got a low side effect profile when used in lower doses. And, you know, it was something that Dr. Bernard Bahari discovered by accident um, when he was dealing with patients that had chronic diseases like HIV and AIDS. Um, He found that it boosted endorphins. And it was one of those things that um, patients with HIV and AIDS and chronic disease had lower endorphin levels. And that seemed to be one of the many mechanisms that seemed to help them cope with different pain or autoimmune conditions. Um, So LDN has been kind of a a passion project for us in the last year and a half. Um, We've worked really hard to educate patients and providers. um, And patients that have used it are excited because it's not a narcotic, it's not going to be a dependency issue, and it really seems to help them get control of their life back if it meets their profile. And it could be any number of things. It could be fibromyalgia. It could be um, um, irritable bowel syndrome. It could be chronic pain. So that's fun. Um, It's been something that I really enjoy the ability to help patients solve problems with our compounding lab, you know, whether it be someone who just had surgery or uh, a little child who was born premature and has a heart condition. 
I mean, those patients are a different kind of patient that have nowhere else to turn in our community. And it's been really rewarding to, to work with them and, and learn in the process. So we really value that relationship we have. And we're looking to expand our, our non-sterile compounding lab facilities very soon. Yeah, so were you guys compounding kind of from the beginning, or was that something that you guys dove into uh, recently? No, we've been we've been actively compounding since about two thousand four. Um, so it sounds like so long ago, but it it, <laughs> it 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 took. It was one of those things that we kind of flirted with and thought, well, do we want to spend all this money to get geared up? And you know, by the time you buy your powder containment hoods and your your special facilities and equipment, it's it's not a cheap endeavor. But um, it's really nice because whether it be a, a man or woman who's dealing with a hormone replacement therapy or like a child that has a cardiac issue, um, it's neat because we kind of have a different patient bond, as you alluded to earlier, with a patient who knows they can't get this from Eli Lilly. They can't get it from Merck. I mean, it's something that's customized to them. It may be customized because they can't swallow. They may have a red dye allergy or something like that. Um, so that's been really exciting. Yeah, that's one of the things that seems um, kind of kind of crazy if you think about it is that uh, medicine is kind of a one size fits all for most medications. Uh, one of the upcoming podcasts we're going to have is uh, with the GuidePoint team uh, up there in uh, Minnesota, and we're going to talk about personalized medicine. Um, where do you see that going? Do you see that coming into your pharmacy? It's it, it seems like it's the year 2021, we should have uh, medicine that's tailored for our chemistry. I totally agree. And there are things out there now that'll blow your mind. I mean, I have um, a colleague that actually has a 3D printer that can print medication in certain doses and dosage forms. And uh, I mean, I think our opportunities for customized medication are endless it just depends on if it's done in a fashion that's responsible and isn't going to be abused. I mean, we all know about the NECC situation where there were patients that were harmed because of greed and carelessness. And that's a huge thing we continue to try to overcome on a, on a regular basis because somebody did something bad and hurt people. But in general, I want to believe that the, the compounding pharmacies and pharmacists out there are out to help their patients. They're not looking for world domination. They're looking to help their community. And um, I, I really think that um, when you think about COVID vaccines, for lack of a better thing, how is it that every person from 18 to 99 gets the same dose, you know? It's kind of strange when you think about stuff like that, whether you're right. 80 pounds or 480 pounds. So... Um, I think we're going to see more, and we already are with some of the specialty meds, seeing a lot more specialty doses. It's just those things are so expensive, and, and generally compounded medications are more affordable. Yeah, it is It is interesting that, you know, um, there are shoe stores that go in and take so much care to, you know, tailor a shoe, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to something that's going to fit your body well. And um I don't know. It, it seems like it seems like there's a lot of opportunity there with compounding. So uh, what else is on your list, man? What's uh, what's your next big goal? Because I know you always have something uh, in the works, something that you're focusing on and, and moving towards. Uh, so what's on the horizon? I just really want to make sure that we can change our model, not only to help our patients and improve adherence and improve engagement, but to find different avenues to help patients that are beyond fill and bill. CPESN has done a lot of work to do that, and I admire everything they're doing to try to help us change our thinking and our model, but we still gotta get paid for it. So it's something that whether it be, you know, we're focusing more on nutrition and nutritional depletions, we're trying to focus more on point of care testing, um, the neat thing in our market is, is that we don't have even a lot of the big chains doing walk-in easily accessible cholesterol tests or A1C screenings or things like that. I don't know that it's ever going to be one of our main breadwinners, to be honest. But people who don't have insurance, 
people who have that $5,000 deductible they're trying to manage, they love it. Um, and that's something that I think has an avenue too as we grow it. Um, and I, I guess other things are – I. One of our one of my big challenges for 2021 is, and we kind of talked about it off the air, but you know, there's so much going on. You're always getting another email. I mean, the the COVID vaccine thing's a perfect example. You know, when you're signed up with more than one federal partner in hopes that you finally get vaccine, you're doing all these trainings, you're trying to keep track of all these documents. So we're really trying to focus on helping our staff be able to say, okay, where is the most current COVID screening, standard operating procedure, and how can I find it in 30 seconds? And, you know, sometimes we fall into that trap of, well, I got to go back through the email and I got to look for it. Um, and everything has gotten so complicated. My One of my main goals this year really is to compartmentalize that data so it's easily accessible and people can have confidence that they know where to find it and know how to use it. Because you can spend hours writing a procedure or fixing a system that's broken, but if people can't find it to read it, to use it, to implement it, what good is it? Yeah. So, I mean, and that may be a little simplistic, but I don't think we can be the best pharmacy we can be until everyone knows on some level how to do something, or at least we have those two people so there aren't a, there isn't a single point of failure. So between being more organized in our offering for information and training and knowledge and preventing that single point of failure, you know, even we took my uh, son to college um, in Chicago this past August, I got three phone calls before I left Ohio. And, you know, I'm like, come on, Brad, you're missing stuff still. So it's, it's a, a daily, weekly lesson of, you know what, I'm not preparing our staff to have the tools they need. And so I'm working hard to prepare my staff to have those tools. And I'm sure there's other people out there doing it better than we are, but, you know, we've got 80 employees. So we've got great pharmacists. We have great technicians. But, you know, I mean, it's every situation's a little different. How do you handle that patient that needs special attention? Um, or how do you deal with that situation when, God forbid, somebody falls in the parking lot or, or something like that? So all those things or something that we're trying to bring together to make it more streamlined and more systematic. Yeah. One of the, one of the things you mentioned was the um, point of care testing. And, you know, that's, that's one of those things that, you know, getting paid on the front end is one, one avenue. Um, but really, you know, managing those chronic disease states over time, you know, when you have a doctor that sees that patient once a year, gives them a medication you're the one keeping them out of the hospital. So being able to record those labs, you know, I think really with groups like CPESN, um, that's where those opportunities are going to be if you're getting the right documentation. So, you know, that's where those, those e-care plans are going to be so important moving forward. Um, being involved with groups like CPESN so that you're not just capturing that, you know, front end, um, point of care testing revenue. But again, that the value is keeping that patient uh, compliant and out of the hospital and that long term investment in your patients, really. So I, I think that's really interesting, because you've been an early adapter to point of care testing, right? We have, but I'll be honest, we're not perfect. I, um, there's things that we haven't taken advantage of. You know, I'm, I have to admit that I know we could have done more with COVID testing. Um, or, or some other things we were getting geared up to revolutionize and introduce. And we did introduce a concierge plan where a patient could have like a special program where they'd have the phone number for one of our pharmacists and for a, a monthly or annual fee, they'd have direct access to the pharmacist. They'd have a couple point of care tests included in the package. They get free delivery. I mean, we have free delivery anyway, but we're trying to limit it to one free delivery a month, and we're trying to leverage our MedSync to, you know, minimize those extra visits, which can be extremely costly. So I think there's a lot of neat things we can do. Um, I had talked to a pharmacist that actually is in a college town, and one of his main services was helping parents who had children at the school with chronic diseases make sure they were never out of their medication, they delivered to their dorms. They talked to the parents when they needed to make sure with disclosures and all. But 
I thought that was a really neat niche for a type of patient care that's out there and needed. And maybe it's, you know, it's also needed a lot for elderly patients. And, and, you know, you've got siblings that are trying to take care of mom or dad in another city. Um, And and I think sometimes we're so busy working on our daily stuff, we miss those opportunities. And that's something that we all have to step back and challenge ourselves with to see what needs out there and fill it. Because I'm not sure Amazon or some of these guys can fill that need. I think we can do it better if we've got that relationship and the access. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's there's no doubt at the, uh, you know, if it's a fight to the bottom on price per pill, you know, obviously um, scale is going to win that one. But there's definitely no competition when it comes to the services that an independent pharmacy can can offer. So being able to really capitalize on that and again share that story is where the value long term I think is uh, is going to be, and and again going to uh, plug CPESN for, you know, helping to organize that and make that a, a reality eventually. So um, before we get off here, what's, uh, what's on your, uh, on your radar for next week? We've talked about large scale. We've talked about when you see a specific issue. So let's talk short term goals. Do you have um, like those milestones set out in the, in the trail forward to uh, throw another Jeep reference in there? <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. And, you know, I would be remiss. Um, uh, so you talk about next week. So here we are, the 28th of January. Um, next week, we'll be going through end of month, and uh, we'll be crunching data from the previous month to see how new Medicare D plans have affected our profitability, productivity, and, you know, what's what's come into our marketplace. Um, and really, I would encourage anyone who hasn't done it to go take a basic Microsoft Excel course, you have so much amazing data in Pioneer. And you don't like one of our challenges has been to get meaningful data in an easy to access way. And when we've got five locations, central is great, but we still have a lot of data to manipulate. So I encourage you, if you've never taken an Excel course, you can change your life and get so much time back by knowing how to do power queries and pivot tables and things. And, um, you know, there's some really amazing tools that you can use in Pioneer to look at your data and identify your most profitable drugs or identify your most painful drugs or find out, hey, we've got all these new providers this month. Where'd they come from? We need to go visit them. So that's like one of my favorite times is like in the first two weeks of the next month because we do our settle ups for Central Phil. And then we look at new doctors, new opportunities, new plans, new drugs. Um, There's so many neat things that you can pull in. And um, I just love being able to drill down and find telling things that our data tells us that we never knew was there just because we didn't look at it in the right way. Yeah, data mining was such a... um you know, a buzzword a couple of years ago, but I mean, really that's, that's what you're looking at. You're just digging out, digging down deeper because there's a, there's a bigger story hidden in those, uh, in those spreadsheets, but you're, you're so right about Excel too. It's like, um, you know, it's like having an iPhone and just using it to make phone calls where there's like so much other stuff that you're like, wow, I could do that. So, <laughs> All right, Brad, I'm going to let you get back to work. We're coming up on the hour mark. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm going to see you soon, hopefully, uh, once we can get back on the road. (laughs) I hope so. I appreciate everything you and Pioneer does for us on the independent pharmacy level, so thank you guys so much for everything. All right, Brad. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Scripts, presented by the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please support our channel by liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so that you'll be notified anytime we post new content. To stay up to date with all of the latest independent pharmacy news and content, follow PioneerRx on your preferred social media platform.